give a rough side out outline of the general topics on which we shall touch in tonight's first part reading. It will be covering such as creativity, comments, <laughs> hearing, The head, <laughs> ah, apartment living, <laughs> team sports, <laughs> and the mystical. Not covered, however, tonight will be anything allegorical, so I'll tell you now. <coughs> the local intellectual game, as normally played in broad open daylight. The head umpire walks on the field. The band begins to play the anthem. The people reverently stand and are shot. <laughs> and out goes the call. Play ball, y'all. And who but man, home plate erectus, can then participate in a game that he himself has all but called off. Neural man and metropolitan areas Metropolitan areas and your old man. <laughs> to the advice doctor comes yet another letter. Dear doctor, on the show you recently read letters from two different viewers. One, of whom, one who said he had rats in his attic and the other who complained of beavers in his basement. And your final comment was that the two of them should get together. Now, upon steady reflection on all of this, as to how it might pertain to the nervous system of one individual, I find myself both somewhat disturbed and yet delighted at the possibility. And I question, is there a connection between the two? And is the answer to that the same as you originally offered to the two viewers? Those now living their lives in upper stories of the city's condos seldom give thought to the infrastructure below. And those firmly secured in the penthouses are wont to even deny its existence. The sign above the entrance to one nascent city proclaimed we are born what we are, but for the city to grow, the sign had to go. <laughs> Try it again. The wind sounds louder up on the observation deck than it does down in the sewers. <laughs> After visiting all parts of the world in one way or another, one man came to this conjecture. The simpler the people, the less guilt they feel. He paused and upon further reflection noted, I was once a simpler people. <laughs> then to relieve a certain tension, this realization seemed to produce, he stopped his intellectual ponderings and turned on the TV and furnace to make himself more comfortable. Yeah. One man began to privately look upon his own mind as some have publicly upon their political institutions, i.e., said he to it, ask not what your government can do for you, but what can it really do? The teacher said to the class, just as water is fluid, so are men's words and thoughts, unless you're dead. And a student asked, how many kinds of death are there? Two, death, death, and being adult death. Hardening of the arteries often first reveals itself in the halls of museums. Another difference between the ordinary and the accurately anxious 
is that the ordinary believes that man's relationship to the creative force initially got off on the wrong foot and that we've yet to correct it. Whereas those with more futuristic eyes sense no such tension and see their only problem as one of slow moving clocks. From the Mystics Dictionary, Life, a train that's always just left. By the by, those of you from other parts, perhaps on other schedules, might care to know that in the aforementioned lexicon, there are no negative pessimistic entries. A boy asked his father, is there a correlation between being poor and being stupid? And the elder replied with his own question. Is there a correlation between being rich and being intelligent? To which the lad replied, observation says, obviously not. Then added the father, but note, only one of the two is commonly commented on. What make ye of this? And the boy, being the true son of the man, suddenly realized they had been discussing a type of wealth not carried in one's purse. So stopped and reflected one man. Why do we not learn from listening to what we ourselves say? One day while the prince was off on a field trip, the royal tutor brought in the king in his stead and so began to instruct him. A wise man and ruler treats all others just as he treats himself. And how is that, asked his majesty, going along with it all. With total indifference, he replied. With total, yeah, yeah, interrupted his grace. I get it, I get it. Moral, only a man truly in charge of his affairs and kingdom can afford to piss himself off in ways such as this. Forecast, lots of times it'll rain even when it's not necessary. One man told the city folks, the only way I can endure what you people call the arts, entertainment, and information is to assume it's all a joke, intentional or not. As they swam, attempting to avoid all the fish hooks, a father noted to his son, <laughs> it doesn't much matter what you do in the everyday world, just so long as you don't take it to be anything of any real significance. And the lad turned and inquired, but if you don't, how would you ever get around to even taking up anything? Ah, replied the papa, that takes care of itself, because no one ever realizes the second part you mentioned first. Of course, if the old man had really wanted to come even cleaner, he had also mentioned the fact that pretty near nobody ever realizes any of it. No one but would-be mystics listen to mystics seriously. Everyone else does so with disbelief and an urgent desire to get out of the water. One man said, I write cartoon soundtracks. And another fellow said, I didn't know you were in the film industry. And the man said, I'm not. I just do them privately in my head. One chap gave himself what he considered to be a sound piece of advice. Never try to get the last word when talking with the ordinary. And his mind spoke up. Does that include talking to oneself? Which it did. A strikingly singular aspect of trying to affect an individual influence on your own internal operations is that the mere presence of effort, even constant and consistent, does not assure success while lack of same guarantees the opposite. No business or other planetary activity could survive on this basis. This procedure is known as the mortal phenomenon. Sheep are never creative, which is one way for sure, no matter how they may disguise themselves to tell that they are sheep. The great thing about riding the bus is that you don't have to drive. Now I counted his seatmate. The truly great thing is that you don't have to think about where to drive to. Plus, he added, this ain't no bus, it's a cattle car. 
One father sought to allay his son with these words. Remember, in a closed system, nothing extraordinarily harmful can ever happen to you. How about death? Replied the boy. Ah, responded the old man. But even that can only happen to you once or subject to your desire more times. <laughs> Jewel points within a finite structure that routine minds therein never grasp is that under those bound conditions, everything can both be explained and not. Based upon your individual dependence on the local verbal atmosphere. The intellectual life of man is a cafeteria line with something for every taste and need always on display and right at hand. The mystical fare, however, you got to hunt for on your own. One man said to an acquaintance, Look, it's not my intention to be offensive, but I've got to tell you that after I talk to you, I almost always feel the worst for it and receive the response. Do you believe that you're saying this to your mind or to every other person on this planet? And the man rhetorically replied, there's a difference. <laughs> Moral. Only a mind under its own control can tolerate crap like this, much less benefit from it. One man decided that the world wasn't big enough for him, so he just moved into his own head. The preceding item was brought to you courtesy of the International Watch It Society. <laughs> <clears throat> it's often hard to hear what's said in a closed system because of the echo, 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 and reverberation, nation, nation. The royal potential, its promise, its loss. The king of one man's mind abdicated his throne to marry a commoner himself. <laughs> A man asked a purported mystical teacher, how can you tell the difference for sure between a real, honest-to-goodness, super-duper guaranteed mystic and a lesser kind? And the teacher replied, with the first type, you're never absolutely certain what they're talking about. And the man thought on this for a minute, then asked, but since I've heard you speak before and wasn't entirely sure of what you were talking about, how do I know that your answer is not self-serving? And the teacher cocked his head and looked at the guy kind of funny and said, You know, I don't believe you're half as stupid as you look. <laughs> and the man broke into a broad, pleased smile in response to the compliment with nary another thought given to such unsavory matters as partial blindness and arthritis via delusions or personal grandeur. <laughs> the reporter responsible for this story also attached to it a reminder that says, Irony and cynicism are not main courses on a mature mind's menu, but rather the flimsiest of appetizers on a child's. <clears throat> Dustily struck was one chap. Is it possible that the true significance of thought is in its mere existence and not its content? This thus would be explained the oft expressed denunciation of comment for comment's sake. Near a mountain stream, a neural warrior stopped and said to, his, to the son accompanying him, There are actually two awakenings, the large and the small. And whereas in one of them your consciousness is freed from comment, in the other you are conscious without constant comment. He then pointed to the sky and then to the clouds and said, similar to the distinction between those two. There are mystical schools and struggles hidden away far from the busy cities, but there are also those secretly flourishing right out in the open in these same locales. This be true in physical cities and also be so in the minds of certain men. One man's observation was, we're presently going through a transitional period to which someone responded, we always are. <laughs> What an interesting menu. Yeah. Those of you capable of doing such things may recall that sometime within your lifetime, recently, uh, we were mentioning the 
matter of mentioning the lack, the general lack of readily available, positive, constructive, nourishing, intellectual fare, if you recall that. Being specific about being critical of life, because if you're ordinary, then remember it is a cafeteria there, and you get what you need. It's always available, and so it's there. And to criticize it because someone behind you or in front of you says, well, all I want is some mashed potatoes and white bread. For you to go, well, what limited taste do you have? You know, why don't you have a falafel and you know, some, something neat and exciting? <laughs> all you're showing is your own provinciality to criticize others because there in the cafeteria is what everyone needs. They may need just mashed potatoes instead of white bread. They may need mashed potatoes and Freddie attacks Elm Street, number 14. All right. White bread and a bodice, well, they got a bodice ripper. In the cafeteria, intellectually, as the ordinary might want to say spiritually, but intellectually is what everyone needs. It is always there. It is on display. It is readily available. You will always find it. But if you try and up the stakes a little bit, while understanding enough, I will point out again, as to be non-critical of those on each side of you, in front of you, and behind you in the serving line. If your taste runs beyond that which is available, you simply do see what I pointed out without it being critical. It is simply the nature of that kind of dining establishment that there is out in life, via all the arts, all the entertainment, all the literature, there is not readily available that to feed an extraordinary hunger, which shouldn't be of any secret. Why else, out of desperation, would you be listening to me, for instance? <laughs> it sounds like that, that one, one tends to regret not having a script and suddenly quip out the old neural derringer and shoot off a toe. I was waiting for anybody to believe that to be able to you know, switch over to nude marriage counseling or whatever, whatever is on an alternative cable channel. There is no readily available constructive material in life. It is not out there. It's just simply the way life's arranged because it would be uh, serving to unbalance the nature of general life, it would be non-constructive to life in general for there to be such information available, assuming there is such information as a material, physical substance. But what I want to get into was the matter of creativity and to point out why, based on that same area, why the creative urge in individuals is so strong and has such sway over people. Now, it can be explained from a myriad of attempted positions, but I am now getting right at the heart of it, having to do with energy, having to do with electrochemical energy. Uh, I, everyone knows uh, that artists will starve for their art. Well, real stupid artists will starve. <laughs> But now, figuratively speaking, a real artist will suffer. You know what I mean. <laughs> that someone who is actually, who, someone who by themselves can go off and enjoy painting, composing music, strumming their guitar, someone who enjoys that uh, and even attempts to look at it either way as necessary for you to make a living at it, <coughs> to are sliced to become known for their talent. The point is, is where the idea of starting for your talent comes from. Those who have that much enjoyment or touch that much or that close to the creative spirit will almost starve. It being not that they're just dumb and stupid because now we're not assuming we're speaking of someone who would literally die of food deprivation just so they could play their guitar, much less a zither. Okay, auto harp. Guy pulls in pep boys. Uh, I just suddenly made up my own 
crude joke, but. The reason that creativity strikes so many people so strongly and why it is so enjoyable is that at an individual level, that comes about as close as people, as men and women ordinarily get to something nourishing. You follow. And I don't mean, I'm not now speaking of the output. We're not speaking of whether someone composes a small symphony that seems worthy of Mozart, assuming that you found that to be an admirable example, whether it sounded like that, whether we're talking about someone who has the composing abilities of a Mozart or a George Clinton or someone who failed. It is not that, it is the enjoyment they get out of it themselves. And that is about as close as an ordinary person ever gets to nourishment of a positive, constructive kind. This should be, the reason I'm bringing it out is that it should be useful because it's, you can feel clearly that it's no longer a theoretical distinction. What it is, and I'm going to assume that all of you, any, generally anyone who is properly interested in this has some sort of talent. And I always play out music and painting, and et cetera, but there are all sorts of things. It could be carpentry work. It could be uh, sewing. It could be any number of things. If there's something you can do, the hobby, the artistic, creative, th is something that you do that by the widest definition is creative. It could be gardening. But it's something that you felt as though you did it. That is so powerful to people. It is so strong that, as I said, we have the general basis of jokes and humorous asides, if not slingshots, go along with it about, well, artists will even starve. It is that it has a singular sway over people, those involved. Philistines, of course, are playing, in a sense, the counterbalance to that so that artists don't get out of hand. And they look at it and go, you people are crazy. You know, get a job. Get a bank account. Wear a suit. Get a shave. Stop all that stuff. That's useless. Why does it matter? You'll never get famous. You'll never make any money at this. It is... It, by its very feel, by its very experience, what I want you to see a limbing of the distinction between that which is not ordinary and which does not fit the true definition of being constructive, that out in life, a man, was that convoluted enough? How many times are you going to ask me that? I don't know. How many times are you going to get convoluted that you can say, that was all not foreplay, footnotes. <laughs> that there is a distinction that almost all of you should be able to feel and recognize between going out in life and finding what would appear to be at first blush the most uh, promising area of encouraging constructive information. Education, majoring in philosophy, our religion, there is a difference that is beyond any question between, if you have that sort of touch at all, of sitting down when it's all going good. It doesn't always go good because I think they call that, what is it? It starts with an L. Well, you know. <laughs> Life. It doesn't always go good, but when it's going good and you're sitting there and you're just doing a sketch. You're just you know, trying to draw the way your hand looks, do it a certain, whatever it is. Or you're fooling around and you're playing and you suddenly stumble across a chord progression that you've never done before. Whatever it is, there is a feeling right then, you sing in your room, in private, no one ever knows about it, that is absolutely incomparable to the best out in the street that life presents. Now, it never goes any further than that. Uh, Men attempt to make it so, which goes into a whole other area that I've touched on before that gets into uh, not gilding a lily. Well, it's kind of gilding a lily and then pissing on it by trying to then present verbal expositions on art because what that amounts to, and not just criticism, but which is included, but the uh, attempt to verbalize, to describe art, then becomes what amounts to an apology for art. Because there is no describing it. 
a true artist of any real intellectual sense would not attempt to describe his art. That gets into another area because if you drag it out in public, the first thing that the public's going to do, and not because the world's full of idiots and Philistines, I'm saying it is the necessary balance. The whole world cannot be artists. So as soon as you pull your art out, if you're going to do that, and you have the chance to make it public, whether it be music or dress designing or woodworking or hem stitching or painting, sculpture, as soon as you drag it out, if you present it out there, uh, don't show yourself to be a double idiot. That is, don't be surprised that the first people that come up are going to go, what in the hell is that? That's the nature of it. Now, that's one thing. That's life. But now you have stepped into the, or you've thumbed right on the honey wagon. If you respond to it, which almost justice prevails again, if you're an artiste, if you have any talent and you drag it out in public and go, huh, huh? And then... I assure you, if three people walk up and look at it, two of them are going to go, Jesus, boy, you're nuts. That sucks. You call it art, and that's what's wrong with the world now. <laughs> Justice prevails. If you're the type to bring it out there to start with, chances are, chances are, you are then going to really step in and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Or, look at it another way. This is a little more subtle, but just as poisonous. It's for... The first people to come up and they look at it and go, I've never seen anything exactly like that. And so you're the artist, yeah? You ready? Here it comes. <laughs> well, forgive me, but what does it mean? <laughs> Somebody has invited you at another level that they said, uh, do you have a knife with you? And you go, well, no. You go, well, I'm sure you'd like to die, wouldn't you? <laughs> and you're not sure yet. And they go, and they ask this question, and you respond, then you reach over. Thankful, obviously. It's their thoughtfulness to bring you a Harry Carey knife. <laughs> that if they say, well, I'm not sure I understand it, would you explain it? And you go, well, I'll be delighted. <laughs> that has brought it back to the level. That has taken away, those of you who have not already stepped in this before, or if you have and you recall it and you wonder, what went wrong? Because ordinary, what went wrong for your view is, I'm surrounded by idiots. I am surrounded, you hit it, by Philistines. No, you're surrounded by life. And the mistake is, from a more expansive view, is to take originality and expect it to go further than it went in you. To expect it to have a bigger impact than it had in you. If life needed that, think about it. The artists sitting around, and all of you will assume, have been through some piece of that, that you thought you were going to write a great novel. You thought you were going to write not just a good novel or a good selling, but something that was going to tear open the spirit of man and reveal to other intelligent people what life's about. And you got something out of it that you sit there and you down there did starve. Hold up in a room for nearly a year writing this, and just more fun, you just couldn't hardly stand it. It was so much fun when it was going good. And if you held up in the room for a year, it went good along, you know, many times you wouldn't have been there. But then to get through and to hand it to a publisher and to expect anything, to expect anything positive after that, uh, you have taken upon yourself to at least the little death. And I don't mean the good sexual variety, but you're just beginning to peel the skin away and kill yourself a little at a time. Because... And when that happened, and all of you will assume again that all of you have had some taste of this, you blamed it on the public. In other words, you blamed it on others. It doesn't matter how big the public, it could just be a few publishers that you present it to. And they went, we read it, and uh, the only thing, I wonder, have you considered psychiatric treatment? Or, you know, I hope you didn't give up your day job, and that kind of thing. So when I say the public, it, could, it might only be two or three people. The point was, you felt totally rebuffed that life did not appreciate the artistic, the talent, the originality, the creativity you put in that. Right! Now you got it! <laughs> but see, what did you expect? Well, I'm doing all this after the fact, but now at least, thanks to you being able to get this information directly from me, now at least you will never do it again. <laughs> the point, one of the points, is to realize how scarce, to say the least, 
is anything resembling creativity on this planet. Now tonight, there was a man in there that says, why do we not learn from listening to what we ourselves say? Numerous occasions I have pulled out examples, and by now I'm sure all of you, will, even did before you met me, is to, in the same way, attack the lack of originality of humanity. But let's take it on a strictly verbal basis. How easy it is to kick around the common use of cliches and catchphrases. That's mm -hmm. real easy. And you can say, well, it represents one thing. Above all, it represents the laziness, the sloth of the ordinary mind, that we'll turn on television or radio and hear a commentator a, somebody, or a president or a prime minister can afford big time speech writers. And we'll just be almost one cliche out of another. Now they may be up to date cliches. They'll be whatever's the latest. Having to do with level playing fields and uh, political correctness of all sorts and whatever it is. This is getting I started to say real tricky and complex, but it's not. As always, I'd rather tell you the point blank truth. It is so point blank that it sounds complex. And if you listen with the old part of your ordinary mind, you keep looking for a way through the maze. And it isn't a maze. It's not a labyrinth. It just seems that it's getting complex. There's so many examples. How about this? Here's something that happened recently, but it's always happening recently. Uh, new problems with a cult somewhere. You know, fires and destruction and uh, intrigue and murders. And uh, they'll mention about some cult somewhere in the world, and the problem they're having, and they will mention the guy who apparently was a founder. And without exception now, they will always mention, they'll show his picture, point to him and say, and they'll photograph and they'll say, the charismatic leader, charismatic cult leader. That now is almost one word in the Western world. Charismatic leader. Thereby follow, just think of any, I don't have any particular one in mind, it's just that no one's in the news now. We're in October of 94, but it's, it's one a year that makes international news. Some Nobody's ever heard of them before. Not on a national level, they'd never make the national news until... They get in some sort of squabble over you know, power and money and these murders and fightings and suddenly it makes the news. And they'll mention, well, a so-and-so cult and you'll know why. And they'll say, in the charismatic leader. <clears throat> now think about it. Now remember, this is real, real, so point blank and in your face that it sounds complex. I don't want you to get stuck on one example. Uh, politics. Now, I'll get back. I may go ahead and use that. But I, I want you to understand, I know how this gets, that especially as ordinary people would say, if I pick out uh, kind of hot topics and your mind begins to listen, you think that you're you know, tuned in some kind of otherworldly version of hard copy or inside edition. <laughs> because I'm not talking about cults. How about... Uh, it's a general important phrase now, the cycle of poverty, or the cycle of crime. That's a good one. In politics, in the world of academia, that we have got to do something to break this cycle of crime. That is, we have poor people in uh, underdeveloped countries, or poor neighborhoods in the developed countries, and they do not have enough money, and they will perpetrate crime, and they came from a family that were poor, their mother and father was poor, and so it's a cycle of crime. It just breeds. And everybody will yes, yeah. And it's just, a, it's now one term, cycle of crime. You can just expect it in almost any political commentary in the Western world today. Uh, or another one. This maybe sound too close to the first one, but we have a phenomenon here in Oklahoma City where we're recording this. I'm sorry, Montpelier, here in Vermont. There is a uh, fellow out here with a farm 
that uh, something's happened. He is now getting visited by Jesus or Moses or somebody on the fifth of every month. And they were pointing out the crowds are just overwhelming the police here. And they make some news now. And, of course, they can't pick it up on the news cameras. But suppose if you look up the side of that silo or if I got a different story or the clouds or when jet planes fly over on the way into New Haven and the sun hits them the right way, they see what appears to be an outline of Moses. Of course, somebody asked, her, somebody swore they saw it, and they said, well, I've never seen what he looked like. And they turned out the guy was in the clothing business. So what, what, what the reflection, what did Moses look like? And he said, what kind of guy? And he said, well, he was about a 42 long. But <laughs> at any rate, they were, it was on the news. <laughs> It was on the news, and, what, and they were mentioning it was overwhelming the state patrol here in uh, Minnesota, Vermont. It's overwhelming that they cannot handle it, but they were saying that now they're sort of getting used to it. It's been going on now for two years or something. But they were saying this time that they were trying to have new parking here for the tour buses and et cetera, and that there are going to be plenty of uh, EMs there, you know, medical emergency equipment. Think about it a second. It's a place where they're having, it's a side of miracles once a month, but they want to assure you that there's going to be plenty of emergency medical personnel there. Of course, I don't know how you know it. Those places in France and throughout Europe, these old ancient places, sites of healings, that they advertise. You know, they got two or two, anyway, the places that the churches and whoever's responsible, whoever's making the buck off of it, and they'll advertise the hours that they're open and year round and come here and they'll advertise. They got crutches and all this stuff, you know, everybody's been healed and et cetera. But they also, part of the advertising is uh, saying how that they constantly have medical personnel on duty. <laughs> <laughs> Which is almost like the one I, somebody told me that you saw driving in here. Is that church right outside of Portland down the, that said, uh, on the marquee, it was about God is answer to all, and right under it said uh, women's counseling Wednesday, 7:30. <laughs> Before I get into it, do remember this now: irony is the flimsiest. Irony and sarcasm, cynicism is the flimsiest of appetizers on a child's menu. This has nothing to do with cynicism. Has nothing to do with irony. Although everything I mentioned. We should be able to look in a new dictionary and next to irony, be those examples. Pictures of the miracle services with EMs all over the place. Uh, all cult leaders, no matter who they are, all cult leaders, once they get famous or infamous, they could have been four feet tall to start with, dwarfs, the most common looking, ugliest, like little trolls, no personality, but by God. Let them have a little trouble, enough to make the news, and they are suddenly the charismatic leader of such and such cult. Of course, I bet a bunch of them, once they know this, they wish now that they were back alive and cash in on that. Because up until then, they'd been four foot tall trolls with no personality. I mean, why else do you want to become a cult leader? In case you never thought about that and get laid. Now back to where we were. Now that I've disavowed you, hopefully, don't say hopefully, hopefully, of all inclinations to become personally identified to take anything I have said thus far the examples as actually being important examples. It's wallpaper. It's the green smell in your apartment. You remember the apartment you live in that's smoke colored and smells green? You remember that one? That's for those of you that can't get it straight about, you mean we actually live in a dragon? Well... So I gave you a way out because you're supposed to have went, well, it's supposed to be and it smells smoky and looks green. Yeah, but I've done that several times. It didn't seem to make you move, so I did it the other way. <laughs> now back to, try right quick, extract all irony, all cynicism, all sarcasm, but irony should cover it for you. I know it's ironic. You can say it's ironic. All the examples I made, uh-uh, that's child's play. That's just the foyer. That should be the foyer into greater understanding. If you would listen to what people say. If men would listen to what they themselves say. Uh, a little even now blunter 
which will sound more complex if you're not listening, this really has nothing to do with language. It really has nothing to do with any specific example, except for this. To call every leader now, every cult leader, once he becomes infamous, once they have enough trouble, enough negative activity occurs within this cult, within this sect, within this political organization. But the cults seem to be the most popular. It sounds better, a cult. <laughs> and the charismatic leader. It would sound as though there might be some importance to the words, but what I'm trying to get you to see is they're not, except in this, on this basis, that if you could hear in a certain way, if you were wandering this planet and actually had a mystic's mind already plugged into you, that you'd replace the card up here with a more up-to-date mystic's card in there. There is a constant continual purpose in what people say but men have no idea what it is and the, I, the example I used charismatic leader don't even try and disassemble that in any ordinary psychological manner or sociological manner or to say well it's because of the ingrained prejudice of organized religion and therefore they treat now don't take any position except this when things become cliches, when things become a catchphrase, when things become in the human tongue, forget the mind, forget their understanding, they've got none. That suddenly, more or less it seems, that all cult leaders now, if they make the news, are charismatic. And forget the fact that you can say, that's why I threw in, that hell, most of them have got to be little trolls and people that you wouldn't want to be around. Or that's the only reason you'd want to start a cult. It's to get somebody around you. You've got no friends. So I'll start a cult. But now that they're dead, now that they've killed a lot of people on the run, or now that they found some ices and it looks like, well, that might be him. <laughs> well, it was just a short pile of ices and it looked kind of, it was a real boring pile. They can say, well, that must be him. And they go, it's now assumed that the charismatic leader of the cult was that pile of ices. There is something continually to be learned by what men say. Ordinary men, because it is life speaking. But here's the blunt, the obscure, the happy, the quick version, is there's no specific, no particular importance in any example you see, such as this one. That's why I keep playing on it. All right, did verbally anybody follow that? I can't stop it. We can't t have a test. If an ordinary intelligent man was listening to all of this and listen to that last sentence where I ask, do you understand that it doesn't matter what's being particularly said, but you can learn from it? An ordinary mind would go, you know, Jesus, you are, you know, I guess I'd be, if they took it at that level, that I'd be beyond crazy. I don't know a word for it. Just astoundingly deranged or just, out of your mind it has no particular significance it has no particular significance any form of irony other than the fact if you can hear anytime you spot irony or hear it it is like a foyer it is an entrance way to additional to some fresh understanding but then if you say of what well wait a minute the thing about uh, the over at the miracle site where people are being healed and seeing operations of Abraham and Jesus, you're saying that they now are stressing the fact that there are plenty of emergency vehicles on, on call there. God, is that ironic? All right. But it's got nothing to do with that. It has to do with the needs of man to adjust to life, continuing to move. And it's according to how strong your constitution is to realize whether... I can put it to you two ways. It's for man him to deal with the fact that life is moving and dragging him, him with it, or life is moving and one of its main thoroughfares is man. In either case, the continuing change in verbalization and description, especially irony, irony is always, it's like the parade about to put down another foot. It's like one of those little toys that used to have a bunch of four or five feet around on a... 
axle and you put it on an incline and just one foot rolls over the other. It's like the next foot's about to come down. It's like you're about to go from one room to another, man collectively. And in the beginning, it's always ironic. It's always, oh, it's ironic. It was ironic to take ordinary history as simply as, as they put it. It was ironic. For Columbus to suddenly stand down the deck and go, damn it, I knew it. There it is. There's Florida. Or there's the Bahamas. It was ironic that it took that to happen when up until then you had at least, they thought back then, 3,000 years of recorded history of people rolling out in little boats trying to fish or go have fun for the afternoon. They get a little off the coast of Spain or North Africa, or Portugal, and their mother would holler, don't go out any further, you fall off the edge of the earth. And now, now I all had to paddle back, and I'm sure many of them had heart attacks or they got close and they went, you realize we're getting close to the horizon, which I don't want to get into that. And the other guy in the boat went, you're right. And I'm just sure that all kinds of people got very tense, got upset. Probably was the beginning of hydrophobia. There's an aquaphobia. There's that fear of shaving lotion. Or you could say, there it was, that finally, Thomas Edison went, no, uh, what was his name, Watson, come here, I want to speak to you. There it was, suddenly, the beginning of modern day communication, the beginning of those of you that's got AT&T stock of the thing finally doing something. <laughs> come here, I want to speak to you. Wasn't it ironic? There it was, when it was 1870, and you had another 3,000 years before that, of people just wearing their throats out, hollering, come home, or come in here. And now you got the phone. You can say, well, isn't it ironic? You understand? It's not ironic. It was simply things move, but if you stand there at a certain cusp, you can say, well, that's ironic. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the area is. But think about now, after saying all that, there is a reason that the ordinary mind of man collectively must say now. You can put must in quotation marks if you must. That now they must say, the charismatic leader. Now, I've already spent at least 15 minutes trying to disavow you from getting involved with specific examples. But even after having done that, and I said, forget trying to disassemble it in a psychological way. Even after having done that, is anyone listening? Think about it. Don't get hung up on any specific example, but now think, how are you going to explain some of the behavior of men unless you have the proper modifiers? How are the mainstream, how is the mainstream of sane collective people right now to explain, to rationalize that their sons and daughters, their mother or wife, people that they may have done business with, they suddenly find out, they went off and they joined that group of people that became a cult up there in Tennessee or over in Norway. That was a whole bunch. That's the ones. Martha, did you realize that's the ones on the news that they just blown themselves up with a whole lot of hand grenades and tore down half of a city, took them with them? She goes, are you serious? And maybe it's their son, somebody they knew. How can you explain that? Within certain bounds, they were known to be sane people. Well, let's say you used to know them. There was somebody you knew, a family member, that they seemed all right. Ah, but they were not left to their own devices. It was not simply them. We must take into account, blah, 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 Fred Smith, Fred Olaf Smith, <laughs> The charismatic leader of that group. <laughs> Nowadays, remember I told you, don't get hung on the example, and you can't explain it psychologically except this. I mean, it's use useless, except it is necessary. Because now all you've got to do is say charismatic leader. And if you're facing the Western world, it is now an automatic release of thinking, is the world going crazy? I knew those people. Well, that was my mother over there. My, my father used to give money to that guy. Fred Yolof Smith, that charismatic leader. It explains it. 
You know, you know what I'm saying. It explains it. What does it explain? Same thing as saying God made me do it. Same thing as the devil made me do it. It's the same thing to keep from having to think if you could do it. Life looked me dead in the eye right after I was born, right after I was conceived, looked me dead in the eye and told me all this shit. And I didn't know what to do. I kind of looked off and it was like it never spoke to me again. And now all I hear is things trying to explain away what life's about. I'll tell you what life's about. It's about everywhere. It's sort of a play on words. You didn't. Everybody wants to know what's life about. What's about? I'll tell you what it's about. It's, a, it's just about everywhere. <laughs> about anywhere you look, there the hell it is. Except people look and they go, wait a minute. What the hell is this? And somebody goes, ah, okay. All right. Now I see what's bothering you. So it's life doing this. See, it's what you don't remember. And, it's, and you go, wait a minute. Yeah, you say that you look all about and there's life. Yeah, yeah, but over here, this is not life. What is this? And they go, oh, uh, that's a charismatic leader. <laughs> or you go, wait a minute, look over here. Don't tell me that's life. Don't tell me that things are as they should be. You, then life makes somebody go, oh, well, what, you know, what we're dealing with, we've got to work on that. that we, there it is again, the cycle of crime. Just, and you go, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay, what? Okay, nothing. What, what, I tell you, the okay, it's... <laughs> you're back to the Greek drama. That life will readily blind you verbally. It doesn't have to do it physically. It will blind you verbally. Or those of you that didn't get it all that pointed out that there is a form of partial blindness and arthritis, courtesy, vis-a-vis, -vis, feelings of personal grandeur, of importance. You don't remember that one? And the importance is very subtle. It doesn't mean that you have to be somebody big. It's that you think that what you think about life is of some consequence. Which, if you're ordinary, it is. You're correct. If you're ordinary and you think that what you think is not of consequence, you're not ordinary. You're insane. You're crazy. But once you get past that level, you realize that the world is full of people. Yes. And everybody has an opinion. Yes. And they all fit. Yes. Okay. Except for this one part. Okay, well, it's that damn charismatic leader. Oh, I thought that was a cycle of poverty. Oh, I'm sorry, yes it was. And being the sharp, being the sharp social observer you are, you know, life almost tripped you up, but you, you immediately called on, and it had to correct itself. And now you say, well, now I feel much better. <laughs> it was an illusion. And I went, yeah, that was it. I was momentarily distracted. That was it. That was it. Whatever you like, whatever it takes to make you, take you through the night, whatever it takes, all you got to do, you're right there with your little tray, and you slide along, and you look down and you go, is that a delusion? <laughs> and life might have originally called it a meringue, and they'll go, oh yeah, and you go, wait a minute, is that a cycle of poverty again? And life go. Life was going to say it was something fresh, like a new form of meatloaf for this week. But if, if that's what you say, you go, well, I was, I was, I thought maybe we were dealing with, again with one of these charismatic leaders, just like that. Life will have the people behind the line go, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, we had the wrong thing there. Yes, that's it. And they'll hand it to you. They won't force it on you, but you can say, well, that's what I was wanting. You can, they can, you know, say, well, and you can say, well, can I think of that? They go, take your time. <laughs> if you listen if you listen to what life said and you could listen with a consciousness freed from comment which is what this is all about and you could simply listen the examples do not mean I hate to have to fall into real theological terminology horse shit whatever the subject being talked about it doesn't matter what they're talking about social matters, religious matters Psychological matters, financial matters, family matters, whatever humanity is talking about, it is life with its little finger and sort of a private part of everybody. And it'll goose you. And you'll think, well, yeah. And any time you feel uncomfortable, it'll kind of goose you in another direction. And you can go, well, and it's like you can be goosed in any way you want to. 
if you like that better than the cafeteria line. <laughs> but if you listen, life is doing it to such a degree that it is just right out there in the open. There's nothing hidden except if you listen to it specifically like charismatic leader. Now, I know it's got pretty convoluted, but you can listen to it, and if it means something to you, do you understand? Then it means something. But if it means something to you, that means that you needed for it to mean something. And you know why you needed it to mean something? Because you could not simply look upon what was going on with that comment. Your wife says, do you realize that that group of people our son joined up with over in Norway have just blown themselves up? And this makes no sense whatsoever until she says, are you telling the news? And suddenly they show and they identify, there it is, Norway, and you know, well, that's him. And they go, the followers of that charismatic, and you go, ah, if you heard it and that meant something to you, or horrible, such and such crime happened today in your city, and they point, a 13-year-old boy with a handgun, and maybe it shoots your daughter, and you, or a friend of yours, and, go, and they say something about it. But it turns out, uh, as soon as the police investigate, it took them within two minutes to realize the child's father is in prison, mother so-and-so. It is, again, we're faced with this vicious, this endless cycle of crime. Mm -hmm. If you need to hear that, to, to give you a comment, then you'll hear it. You'll look around the cafeteria line and you think, well, none of this makes sense. And it's like, suddenly you get a little pride. Or they'll begin to announce the menu. Somebody will read it aloud. Cycle of crime, cycle of poverty, childhood traumas, childhood abuse, repressed memories, and something you'll find, ah, wait a minute, I like that. And I go, oh, oh, okay, right here. But the example does not matter. The point I was having the man uh, bring up, and which I was bringing up, we got one more minute. Okay. Was well, simply that if you listen to what people say, forget the example, he didn't, it's what people say. If we would listen, he said, why don't we learn from what we ourselves say? But an ordinary person go, well, ordinary people would put up with that. They'll go, yeah, that's a good idea. We should listen more. But what they mean is we should listen more so we can criticize. We should listen to them doing stuff like childhood trauma. Don't give me that crap. He's a damn thief. It's not a cycle of poverty. Shoot them. They're just damn uncivilized. Uh-uh. See, that's not it. The examples do not matter whatsoever. It's that you listen, and life is continually, in a sense, hypnotizing man, verbally. That's the primary way it's done with the intel at the intellectual level. He's constantly hypnotizing. It's like a constant symphony. I got news for you. Life makes Mozart look like child's play. I mean, the man's supposed to sit around a swab drugstore and write symphonies on the back of a napkin in his head. Life can do it just like that. Whatever it is you want, like, oh, yeah, right here. And if you don't say anything you like, it starts making up new things until one of them strikes you. Ah, I like that. Cycle of charismatic. I like that. Life goes, hey, you got it. You got it. It's just you listen because life is having to continually write a whole new symphony constantly and hypnotize. And it's doing it with words. And it just, man continues to talk and never listens. And ordinary people would want to jump on that. They, they can go along and go, you're right. And if I said, really? They go, yeah, let me give an example. <laughs> See, that's the whole thing. If they give you an example, or that is themselves, they're done for. Because their example is, they're, they're back at the line going, uh, let me give it, let me have that example. And life to itself smiles and goes, oh, here, sir, very, very astute on your part. Here you go. No, they'll even compliment you. Like, oh, very nice. And to itself, all life's doing, non-verbally, is chuckling, knowing, well, back in the cattle car, everything's fine, everything's safe. Bye.